who raises these people? Are these people plucked from a garden as opposed to being raised by actual human beings? And we are definitely recording. We always have technical issues. And we use the same equipment every single week. Yeah, if, you, if you're a pro bono producer, <laughs> hit me up. Pro bono. <laughs> you know, doing the Lord's work. Mm-hmm. Welcome to episode nine of the Humpy Podcast with me, Kay, and my co-host, S. Lockdown's been semi-lifted. Yes. Right? Depends where you are. For the most part, it depends. Um, it, like I said, it depends where you are, but for the most part, everyone is, a, is free to roam the world, really. So apart from international travel, most things are... You've got now, I think, indoor, I'm going to say indoor feasting. What's what's the right word? <laughs> indoor dining. <laughs> <laughs> indoor dining is now a thing. Gyms mm-hmm. are open. Uh, shops yeah. are open. Non-essential shops are open. I think you can pretty much travel wherever you want to go. Within the country, yeah. International travel is the only thing that's kind of still touch and go. How are you feeling about it? Because I haven't noticed a difference because I don't think people have been taking... Same. People just been acting. The same. I, I had a gym class. How many people? Uh, four. Okay, but not bad. Very big room. When I got, uh, one, one of the fellow people held out their hand to greet me. In, in whose 2021? Because it, was, a, it, it was like um, a local sports club and I was going for a trial session. Did you shake it? So I shook it, but okay. I, I don't know. I don't, it just kind of, it just made me realize that there's, there's a different world out there. People have different risk assessments. I'm not shaking the hand of any strange man or woman. That's all I'm going to say. I'm not shaking anyone's hand. No one's marum for you. <laughs> no, I'm shaking no one's... No one is touching my hands. I, because also, it's quite confusing because there is a green light, amber and red. So red is no-no. The government's very clear. Don't go. And if you come back, absolute quarantine. Amber is you can go, but it's not that bad. But we don't advise you to go, but you can if you want to. And if you do, you quarantine in your house. So you're either in the hotel managed quarantine system for like 10 days or... Even in the Amber? I think so, yeah. I'll be honest, I haven't looked any of this up because it's not like I have a holiday board. Also, the reason why I've not looked this up is because my behaviour hasn't changed since March 17th. Um, Nor will my behaviour. 2020. No change. No changes either for me. Isn't it crazy? I see people on Instagram, on social media... Living like it's 2019. <laughs> and I'm like, where is this confidence coming from? I don't know. Is it just you and I being overly cautious? Because if you look at the number of hospitalizations, look at the number of deaths. Mm-hmm. I mean, didn't we have a day recently where we had no deaths or single digit deaths and we're yeah. having yeah. very low? It's a calm before the storm. The Indian variant storm, should I say. Because that variant, when it's going hit, to hit us, is going to absolutely hit us because you can't tell people you can go out but be cautious because what does caution mean caution means don't go or caution means go but wear a mask and social distance and i think if the messaging is very mixed as always this is a, this is typical of our government and i just hope that they have enough hospital beds for when the indian variant takes over we should be able to trust the government we should be able to listen to the government I don't, I, but I don't understand why people do listen to the government. As in, the government have no power over the virus. They do. Boris does. He speaks to them one on one. He has this, ever since he got <laughs> infected, he has this, this wave, exactly. Because I, I don't see what the government easing restrictions, why people jump on that as if. It's the be all and end all. But there's the same government that tells you to, vac- to get a vaccine and you don't. I mean, thankfully, we don't have the same levels of hesitancy as in other parts of the world. But it's also, remember, it's the young people next, right? So it's the... 34, I think, today? Yes, and I think that that's the group where we're going to see higher levels of hesitancy because young people just don't know their own um, mort- mortality. Because you're young, you're sprightly, you know, you'll be okay. I think that's the group that we're going to see. People are going to be quite hesitant to get it. Yeah. I mean, I'm still waiting to be vaccinated. And even then, until I get my second vaccination, I don't think I'm going anywhere. I am with you, but we'll talk about it afterwards because right. I don't want to incriminate myself. Yeah. <laughs> also, I didn't know that you can literally call up Matt Hancock. Well, not him specifically, but you can call one of his people and get the lateral flow test. Yeah, you can order the, the test to your local pharmacy, to your house. No one told me. I found out about this recently, a couple of weeks ago, because I had to do something and 
I had to leave my house. Oh, you know, we've got the lateral flow test. So, you know, if you want to double check. I was like, okay, what does it involve? Oh, throat swab, nasal swab. I'm like, oh. And then someone said something that just didn't sit right with me. So I had to like, ask again. And there's double dipping. I'm not with that. Yeah, you have to. So you, no, I would, no, I would go no. mouth and then nose. I'm not, I don't care what order you do it in. I'm not doing that. That's, that's not, hey, hey, listen, go get tested, go get vaccinated. But but wait, are they not double dipping even in the PCR test? Hey, I'm not putting myself in compromising positions. I am masked <laughs> up everywhere. I'm social distancing. I don't need no Q-tip any of my internal. Wait, so you, wait, so you didn't get it done? No. <laughs> Fair enough. You know, I respect it. Fair enough. What do I look like throwing up in a public space? Wait, so, wait, so what, what is the thing that's going to make you throw up? The nose or the mouth or both? All of it. It's unneeded. But I don't understand. You knew about this from the beginning. You... No, I didn't know you double dip. You didn't know you double dip? You double dip. Yeah. I only got that two weeks ago. Because the planet is dying and we can't use two different swords. But two sides. Yeah, but then they need both sides, don't they? I mean, to be fair, you could cut ends of the cube to put it in the tube, but I don't know if it will fit in the tube. Maybe that's why they're doing it. I don't know. Mm. Yeah, but anyway, so... I'm not... Yeah, I'm, I'm probably going to order the lateral flow test as soon as we get done. So today we'll be talking about Keir Starmer, but before that, I think it'd be remiss not to mention, I think probably the biggest story in the world right now, mm-hmm. the... The escalating tensions in the Middle East Mm -hmm. between the government of Israel and uh, Hamas. Look, I I try not to talk about things I don't know about, enough about. I'm trying to do my research. I'm trying to understand the situation a lot more. But sometimes it's just a question about natural justice, right? Mm -hmm. I don't need to understand the historical context to look and see something and just feel that this is not right. Mm -hmm. So when I saw the destruction of this set of flat in Gaza, and then uh, I think it was like a week later, the building that housed the Associated Press, Al Jazeera. That, to me, doesn't look right. I mean, yes, Hamas should not be firing rockets into Israel. Mm-hmm. Also, just because of futility of it. That's one of the things like I just don't even understand from a, whatever your aims are, you're not, you're not achieving them by firing rockets into, into a country that's got an impenetrable shield. But I've always felt the Israeli response is always disproportionate. It's always overhanded. It's not proportional. And by that, I mean, it's not responding to direct threat. It's used to further maybe larger aims. Yes. I don't think it's a secret that the Israeli government would rather Gaza didn't exist. Yeah, and I think, I thought you were going to say it's not a secret that they have nuclear weapons. But I, I, I kept hearing, you know, people on the pro-Israeli government side, and let's be clear, we've, we've been very clear, Hamas and the Israeli government, they are people in both regions who want peace who want a resolution, who don't want the demise of each other. They just want to yeah. get on with their lives. They want their children to be fed, taken care of. They want to be able to have businesses, live, you know, it, without fear and with prosperity. So it's it's definitely Hamas and it's the government of, yes, they, and also they have their supporters across the world yeah. in that particular region. I will say... And sorry, just jump in. And we're talking about the Israeli government, mm-hmm. which is essentially a political party, yeah. and Hamas, which is a political party. Exactly. So not the Israeli people, even though, you know, people have a spectrum of views in Israel and not the Palestinians who, again, will have a spectrum of views, but I suspect. Exactly. And not even of Islam and Judaism, right? Because mm. we, we've seen this conflict be framed in a religious way, in a political way, in a historical way. And yes, all these different spheres come together to explain the context of this conflict. But the fact is, there are people in Israel, like you said, who won Gaza carpet bomb the people in Gaza who want the same for Israel. The fact is only one group has the ability to do that, and that is Israel. And with great power comes great responsibility. You know, we've long heard that Israel is the sh- is the shining light on a hill in terms of it's the only democracy in that region. It is the place where I've heard a lot of people say this is where if you're an Arab in the region, this is this is the, this is the place to be, you know, Arab Israelis are living it up. That's not necessarily true. That also is true in some sense. But we don't have to be historians. We don't have to be Jewish ourselves. We don't have to be Palestinian ourselves. We don't have to have a personal connection to these places to say that whenever this conflict rises, you know, whenever it rises to the point of violence, of rockets being thrown, of, of, you know, the armies getting involved, 
one side so tends to suffer a lot more. And that's a problem. Because he, anytime there's a human cost, that is a problem because it's always women, children, men, innocent people who have nothing to do with anything. They just want to get on with their lives. The argument that Israel is the only democratic state in that region, I think that, and maybe we'll do an episode about this, but I think that bears scrutiny. Absolutely. Especially in the re- especially in the past decade with, with Netanyahu being at the helm. Exactly. Because the question is this, what is democracy? Is it simply a mechanism for deciding who rules? Or is it a broader set of values? China and DPRK have nominal elections. They go through mm-hmm. the mechanism of voting. They go through the ritual of voting. Mm-hmm. And of course, like we all know it's a sham. But the point is that democracy isn't simply the process of having 10 candidates on the ballot going and casting a vote. It's a broader mm-hmm. set of values. Mm-hmm. Freedom of speech, the rule of law, yeah. the sanctity of life, you know, whatever it is. We should be asking, does the Israeli government adhere to these wider principles? Yeah. Are you upholding the rule of law? Are you showing due diligence? due diligence it kind of reminds me i don't know if you read about what happened in uh rio brazil yeah there was the i think the the deadliest shooting in a favela in or in that particular favela i think 20 20 odd uh people were killed in one day okay didn't didn't read about this so the police first of all the the mayor of rio is a close ally of bolsonaro Mm -hmm. the police do these do these raids in the favelas they kill people without without arresting them and giving them due process and due trial. You have to ask the question, is Brazil a democracy? Yes, they've gone to that process, but where you have no due process, you have no rule of law, where you have no recourse to into the law, how do you appeal your sentence when the police officer puts two bullets in your head? Yeah. So we must review what we mean when people use the, the word democracy. It's not just voting. Yeah, and I think also there are degrees to democracy, which is why... What is that organization that every year releases a list of democracy? And I think the number of countries which have kind of slid to the more authoritarian end of the scale. Yeah. We get more and more countries. Is Democracy is a scale, right? Yeah. So you can have, like you said, you can have elections that are free and fair in the sense that people can vote for who they are. But if there's only two candidates who are sanctioned by the ruling, the, pe- the powers that be, is that a true democracy? Yeah, is Hong Kong a democracy? Exactly. Well, they yeah. would, some would say yes, some would say no. And also, you, when you look at who Israel is surrounded by, that's not a really good. That's not a great metric to go by. These are authoritarian countries. You, you're measuring Israel against Saudi Arabia, for example. Saudi Arabia can't say anything about what Israel's doing to Hamas because of what they do to people in Yemen. Yeah. Um, so maybe we'll talk about this when we do our full episode, but. The treatment of Palestinians across the Middle East. Mm-hmm. I, I don't see how people can shout free Palestine and not care about the treatment of migrant Palestinian workers in Qatar, in Saudi. In Jordan. Right, in Dubai. Mm-hmm. Yep. Once again, the people in Palestine are being used as political football. It's, it's quite depressing. I also want to say some, one thing as well, because I've seen on the Twitters, on the internet, on the interwebs, that this is a podcast for black british people in that we we, that's who we are and that's the perspective we bring to this podcast right and in in a sense we're speaking to our people and i say our in quotations right so that irrespective of race irrespective of anything as long as if you if we say things that you agree with then you're our people right and if you subscribe to our values and our views you're our people yeah now that i've said that i've seen people on black twitter say things like what is a link between the black struggle and the Palestinian struggle. Why should I care about the Palestinians when I know that there's a lot of anti-black sentiment in the Middle East? Anti-black sentiment is global, first of all. Yeah. So that's not that's not peculiarity of the Palestinian people or the or Arab people across the world, right? That, that's mm-hmm. one thing. But if you are truly a person who believes in human rights and and values that speak first from a point of empathy and human, just the the, the idea that you're a human being, I'm a human being we both bleed, I want the best for you and in the hope that you want the best for me, we don't have to be Palestinian, we don't have to be Arab, we don't even have to know anyone to feel a sense of what's happening is wrong. And also, we can walk and talk at the same time. You can be a supporter of BLM and you can be a supporter of the Uyghurs in China, you can be a supporter of Muslim people in India, you can be a supporter of the Palestinian people, you can be a supporter of of disenfranchised, abused people across the world and feel a kinship towards them. 
100% agree. What are the first principles of your anti-racism? Is it simply, I don't want stuff done to me, but I don't care if it's done to other people? Then you're not an anti-racist. You're against racism when it's, when it's perpetrated against you, but you're not an anti-racist. There, there are no first principles to your point of view. And in that sense, is it really an ethical and moral framework? I don't, I don't really think so. If you're happy for, to see other people suffer and be oppressed, as long as it's not visited upon you, then... Mm -hmm. Some of our greatest leaders in, our, in the Black community, Nelson Mandela, um, MLK, MLK Jr., they spoke of dis abused people and disenfranchised people across the world. Freedom for us, the civil rights movement has been a beacon of light to many people across the world, Black people across the world who are not African-American, who saw that movement and took strength in that and read the books, listened to the speeches, spoke with these people. Even Mahatma Gandhi, yes, he had funky things happening with the young girls and goodness knows he is definitely worthy of some scrutiny, spoke to the apartheid movement. And yes, he had racist views and no one is perfect. And this is not what the, my point is. My point is there is always a solidarity of abused people. It was the same Native Americans who donated money for the for the Irish people who were going through the, you know, in the potato famine. Mm, there was a I sense of that, yeah. there was a sense of kinship between them. We don't have to know you. We don't even have to know where you are. But we can we can if we hear of your suffering, it connects with us. And don't let different struggles of people take away from your humanity. You can still feel something for other people across the world. You don't have to know the history, but you, if someone is suffering, someone is someone mm. is being abused, and you've at at some point in your life felt that for your people, in a way that there should be that kinship. That's a really good segue into our next topic because. What you're articulating there is essentially, I guess, what would have been called the internationalist position, the idea of international yeah. solidarity, mm -hmm. or whether it's maybe class that transcends national borders. What we have in the UK at the moment is a retreat from that internationalism. Understandably, the right has never really been, never really subscribed to that idea. And in some ways, nationalism is the opposite of internationalism, obviously. Mm -hmm. Is Labour still an internationalist party? Or has Labour seen the gains made by the conservatives and other right-wing parties and decided that it too has to retreat and it has to back the nationalist cause. We've joked on this podcast about the amount of flags <laughs> in Keir Starmer's background. And look, go listen to our very first episode. That was at the beginning of this year. We gave mm -hmm. Keir Starmer the benefit of the doubt. We were rooting for you. Right? <laughs> He's now been leader for over a year. We had the elections a couple of weeks ago. I don't think it's a disaster that Labour, that the media is saying it was, because Labour won a bunch of mayoral seats. Mm -hmm. Labour did well in some councils. It took, it took, it actually won seats in the south, but it lost seats in the north and it lost Hartlepool. Mm -hmm. The question today is, where is Labour and what do we want from Labour? Looking back on Keir Starmer's year in, in office, what, what have you made of it? So has it even been a year? Yeah, it's been over a year. That's, okay, I was going to say, because it seems like a. Googling, googling, googling. He has been leader since fourth of April. Okay, so we're giving him a sort of an annual annual assessment. Your MOT. <laughs> oh, that's very giving me flashbacks of not the time. The thing is, Jeremy Corbyn was a disaster for the Labour Party. However, controversial. Jeremy However, Jeremy Corbyn, you know, you know when you catch something that's already going down, mm -hmm. and so you, Jeremy Corbyn joined the Labour Party during its decline. So actually, I don't think he was responsible for the demise of the Labour Party, but I think he was a symptom of the direction of the Labour Party was going, or it wasn't taking the rest of the country on its journey. Is what I will say. Oh, okay. I mean. I think some would find that controversial view because... Gosh, momentum, leave me alone. Under, under Corbyn, the Labour Party became, I think, the largest political party, the largest membership political party in Europe. I think at one point you had 500,000 members. Mm -hmm. um, arguably, Corbyn had Labour's best performance since Tony Blair. And I guess the... One of the questions, and maybe maybe not for today, maybe, maybe for today, is are the failures under Starmer mm -hmm. part of the general trend that you're talking about or because he failed to continue the legacy of Corbyn? So the thing with, so the thing you say about Jeremy Corbyn and 
Jeremy Corbyn had an momentum, pun fully intended, and he brought a lot of people on his on, on, on his ride. But who were these people that were on the ride? Because you, ha- you need to have the ability to bring every single person together. Blue collar workers, white collar yeah. workers, because our country is not made up of one group predominantly. Right? You need to electrify voters on different levels. And a lot of the people that Jeremy Corbyn electrified were students. Essentially, he was preaching to the choir. So is your church really building if the choir just keeps growing? You need like when do the sinners come into the church? When do the you know if, if the pews are empty but the choir is burgeoning, is your church really growing? Because I think he was speaking to people who already were on board with his message, and therefore I think that there was not a requirement on his part to be. Because let's be real, people want politics to be to be sexy and to be electrifying. They want to Tony Blair speeches, for example. Tony Blair, for all the things that I'm no fan of Tony Blair, but Tony Blair had that unique ability to electrify people. And it was because he was young and he was handsome. He seemed like a fun person. Because, you know, people will say, like, if, if, you're, if you're R&B singer, people either want to is it sleep with you or, or no, women, want to, women should want to sleep with you and men should want to be you. <laughs> now, I know in the age of Me Too, that's a, that's a hot take, but you kind of get what I'm saying. Yeah, Jeremy Corbyn was electrifying yes i agree and i think it's a question we asked before on this podcast do you win elections by making sure your base turns out so you kind of assume there's this natural constituency of people out there who are natural labor supporters and your job is to get them out get your 37 percent out your 38 percent out and if you can get your 38 percent out you've won the election or is it about gaining new voters building new coalitions renewing in your electorate and maybe what you're saying, in my mind, the way I'm reconciling what you're saying with the fact that the Labour Party grew under Corbyn is that Corbyn solidified an existing electorate, but maybe didn't expand it to new people. Yes. Uh, yeah. And maybe that's a trend that, because remember when Tony Blair was in power, Labour had tons of seats in Wales, in Wales and Scotland. Mm-hmm. Labour now has, is it four seats in Scotland? I know it's not more than 10. Labour has lost seats in the north. Labour has lost seats in the southwest. Labour has basically become a party of the big metropolitan cities. And so maybe that's like a wider trend that Corbyn would not be able to to reverse. But Corbyn aside, coming back to our boy Keir, mm-hmm. how do you think he's done? Keir Starmer is a victim of the times in terms of the pandemic. But he's also a victim of of himself, right? So we've had 125,000 plus deaths due to the mishandling of the pandemic in the UK. But at the same time, we've had a really successful vaccine rollout. And Keir Starmer, I think, in my eyes, has found it really hard to toe that line and say, yes, the vaccine rollout is going really well, but let's not forget that there's a PPE scandal waiting to happen. Let's not forget that we need a COVID inquiry. Let's not forget that 125,000 people plus counting have died from COVID. Let's not forget that we've had like what two waves now or three waves, is it? Where the government has acted at the very last minute. Let's not forget the fact that this government is not listening mm. to the scientific advice. Even, to, even today, the fact that India was put on the red list at the last minute because we were trying to hash out a deal with India. And we didn't, we didn't want to upset Modi. So, you know, we kept the, the the borders open. And even when the borders were supposedly closed, how many planes flew into the country? We have this variant, which is a variant of concern. Scientists are saying it is, I think I've read up to 60% more transmissible, right? Mm. So not to get carried away, but you need to find a way to congratulate the government for the good that they're doing, but at the same time lampoon them for the bad things that are happening. And I think he's found that very hard to do. And I think that we underestimate in our country the need for performance and for showmanship. You know, it's fr- funny because we always say that of Americans, right? They expect their presidents to, essentially before the elections, a two-year trip, dancing around the country, kissing babies, shaking hands, eating hot dogs. But that's something that we need in this country too. And I think that when I've watched PMQs, he's every much the lawyer but he's not the politician. And I think that Jeremy Corbyn had this ability to speak to his base 
in an amazing way, but but didn't have the ability to speak to the rest of the country. Because I remember reading articles about he was a Highgate um, elite. And was that, was that, what was the word they were using? Because he's from Highgate, right? Um, Islington. Islington. It was like, is, this Islington elite. Yeah. Completely forgetting that, look who is full of the Tory party. There's this pipeline from Eton to Oxbridge to Parliament. And we never talk, we never talk about that. There was something I said of Jeremy Corbyn where he was like, he's, he's like too, is he like he's vegetarian and he's not, he's just not, you know, he's just not man enough. And, and all of this weird masculinity test that we do to, to men who we expect to run the, you know, to run the, to run the place. There is something magical in every bad sense of the word that Boris Johnson is doing to the country, that somehow people on the left are unable to recreate, but do it for our side. Why is it that Boris gets carte blanche to do everything? He's had, the woman he said he didn't have an affair with came out and said he had an affair. He hasn't paid like 600 pounds, which we could, let's just all do past collection plate around the country. Let's pay off his, you know, his CCP, CCJ, sorry, there seems to be, the country seems to be very forgiving of Boris Johnson, but we're very, but we're not willing to forgive Keir Starmer. And that speaks to something of us in the country, but I think that also speaks to something about Keir Starmer in that he's not speaking to us. I, we talked about this in an episode where he had his, he had, he, what was the thing when Labour relaunched, right? And he had the speech and it was meant to be a speech that was meant mm. to, you know, yeah. tell us what it is that he wanted us to do. I read the speech, I thought this was a really good speech, saw the speech and kind of just didn't really feel inspired by that and and that's a problem i'm not saying that i am keir out gang Mm. but okay so a couple things in my mind one is the reaction to the election was shambolic what was the need to do a reshuffle i don't understand how people don't learn from history remember when corbyn did that disastrous reshuffle that was unnecessary unneeded and took like 48 hours that's what Keir Starmer did the same thing. There were lots of positive results for the Labour Party to celebrate. Andy Budham did absolutely amazingly in uh, Liverpool. No, Manchester. This is, I was talking, I was, <laughs> today I was like, is he from Liverpool or is he from Manchester? Or am I confused in the accent? Is this why the North hate us? <laughs> I'm going to go with Liverpool. No, I'm going to, no, it's Manchester. Manchester. Because, I watched, because I watched that BBC show with the Manchester um, No, he's a male, great. He's the mayor of Greater Manchester. Yes, it's Manchester. Liverpool, I think, was was it the first female mayor? Listen, I've had a long week. I don't know these people. It was a mixed result. In politics, you accentuate the good and you diminish the bad. And instead, you launched into this shambolic reshuffle. Why, why on earth were you sacking? What did Angela Rayner do wrong? You said you take full responsibility. No, Angela takes full responsibility. Adopting the morality of Boris Johnson does not give you the electoral appeal of Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson will sit here and tell us, I take responsibility for everything, but yet he's still here the next day. You said you take full responsibility and then two hours later you're trying to demote Angela Rayner. Okay, okay, put that to one side. Then you sack Annalise Dodds, the shadow chancellor, and you replace her with Rachel Reeves the most right-wing member of the shadow cabinet. Mm -hmm. You can't spend a year defending yourself against attacks that you've turned Labour blue, you're the right-wing candidate, you're a Blairite, and then appoint the single most important person. The shadow chancellor is probably one of the most important, probably the most important shadow politician. And you turn to Rachel Reeves. So I, I think we should take a step back and maybe do a little bit, a little explainer here. So the shad, so... The shadow chancellor. So the chancellor on a regular day at the moment is Rishi Sunak, right? Yeah. And this person essentially has the purse, controls the purse strings of the country. So they yeah. set the economic policy. They kind of determine how much your milk costs in, in a distant way. I'm not an economist, but I know that they have incredible power after. They affect your daily life in, in very big ways. They set the budget, how much the NHS gets, how much education gets. They're really important. The shadow chancellor does that on the other side. They critique what the current chancellor is doing, but also what they're doing at the same time is spelling out a vision for the country if they were in power. Because the role of the opposition is 
yes, in the flowery sense, it's to keep the government in check, blah, blah, blah. But in a raw sense, what they're doing is, as a as a government is living up their vision, they're telling an opposite story. That's their role. When Boris's decisions lead to 125,000 people's deaths, the role of Labour is to say, if that were us, we would not, that would not have happened for these reasons. And when you put us in power next, we're going to, for example, increase NHS spending. We're going to have special funding for mental health services. We're going to fund special education, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That is the role of the shadow chancellor. And, and like you said, when who you put into that, into that seat speaks to a lot of what you want to do for the future. Exactly. It signals something, right? Yes. So even though they're not, they might not be the most visible politician, it's, it's an important signal. It's an important signal to party members. It's an important mm-hmm. signal to MPs. It's an important signal to activists. So that, that was like my first beef with, with Keir Starmer. Second, I still don't know what Keir Starmer stands for a year into his leadership. I could not tell you what he stands for. So that's my second beef. And the third is... How... I'm speechless. <laughs> After a year... What was that saying that's, I think, attributed to Napoleon or some, you know, you know these things that are basically anybody who ever picked up a sword or a gun <laughs> and wore a soldier's uniform. Um, do not interrupt your enemy when they're making a mistake. Mm-hmm. Kissman might be the exception to the rule. Boris Johnson and the Conservatives have made mistake after mistake after mistake after mistake. And somehow you've not capitalised on this. It blows my mind how, how weak, how, how tasteless, how tepid, how flavorless, how gray can you be? This is a moment of madness. I mean, I'm... <laughs> I am I'll, just you, I'll just let you have your moment. Here's the thing. Okay, one more, just one more thing. One more yeah. thing. Like, the Labour Party is against the decriminalization of cannabis. Yes. In that tells you everything about the Labour Party. I'm not saying this is the most important policy position. I'm not saying this is the most, mm-hmm. would even be my top 20 things if I was in power. On a personal level, yeah, let's go for it. But when you don't realise that the arbitrary designation of cannabis as Class B has put lots of people in prison who shouldn't be in prison for the mere act of possession for personal consumption, you have lost your sense of justice, your sense of equality. Where is your sense of opportunity? Where is your sense of, of fairness? If you think it plays, ba- it plays bad electorally, be silent on the matter. But to come at in opposition to it and citing your days as DPP. You know how Joe Biden said, and we talked about this in our very first episode, how Joe, what Joe Biden said of uh, Rudy Giuliani, <laughs> that a Rudy Giuliani sentence was like a verb, a noun, a 9-11. <laughs> I think he said like every Rudy Giuliani sentence includes a verb, a noun, a 9-11. Right? <laughs> every Keir Starmer line is like, I was director of public prosecution. We get it. Oh my goodness. Move on. I mean, okay. There's so much in that that you say. We need a leader who has good political sense and knows how to speak to his audience, knows how, knows how to play politics. And I think Keir Stemmer does not know how to play politics because he may truly believe as head of public prosecution, right? Because he was a director of... DPP is director of public prosecution, so he... So he was head of the Crown Prosecution Service, which is the main agency that's responsible for essentially taking criminals to court. Yeah, right. An important job, a massive job. Absolutely. Now, the thing about even the just sidebar, the cannabis thing, lots of people who've worked in criminal justice always come out and say, I've worked in criminal justice and the war on drugs just does not work. How is it that you have come on the opposite side and have not really explained it to us beyond I was a public prosecutor? Because Chief. a lot of people who've been through all of that, it's very clear now. We have, do a Google if you want to. There are lots of papers full of statistics from economists, from, social, from, social, from the social studies. Sociologists say that the war on drugs just does not work. It's too costly economically and the human cost is just far too high how do you come out and say that especially when the uk is one of the biggest import exporters of like medical marijuana chief constables have come out and said it's not working our approach to drugs is not working and also how many of them have said we just don't prosecute we just give off a warning we just don't bring these people to court because our courts our jails our prisons will be full 
of people with low level non-violent dr- drug possession. These are, these are not drug traffickers. These are not people who who are also doing human trafficking on one side. As they, these are people who just have a spliff on them. I know you had you you're going to say more things, but whatever the merits of, of it, we are in the middle of a culture war. Mm-hmm. Right, the government has relentlessly pushed this culture war stuff. Labour has had no response, and this cannabis response. We have supposedly a liberal progressive party in opposition. Yet I am struggling to find liberal progressive policies. And that to me is the problem. Labour came out opposing the raising of corporation tax. I don't why? understand. I don't How? understand why you're here. <laughs> so so the culture war is a very interesting one. And I think it's I think it's deserving of a special episode where we talk about cancel culture, culture wars, culture clashes patriotism, nationalism, fascism, all of that. But we're in the middle of a culture war, like you said, whether we want to or not. You cannot be in politics and completely act like it doesn't exist. You have to mount a robust response for whatever side that you believe in. And we've seen the people on the right do that, right? We've seen people come out and say, we believe this, you know, cancer culture is a real eminent threat to our, to our democracy, to free speech. And so we're going to launch GB News. Andrew Neil other people have essentially started their own Fox News channel in the UK. That is a robust response to, to a perceived culture. I'm going to say perceived, perceived culture war. You cannot be Keir, Keir Stammer and I think it was, Angela was the d- deputy at the time. They took the knee for Black Lives. Amazing. What next? Even in his speech, that was meant to relaunch the Labour Party. You talked about equality, you talked about racism. What next? What is your flagship policy? You know, you earlier you talked about, you know, you don't know what Keir Stammer stands for. I wasn't the biggest Jeremy Corbyn supporter. There's, there's certain things about Jeremy Corbyn that I absolutely respect. The fact that he's been steadfast in... He's our, he's our Bernie Sanders, but to a lesser degree, because Bernie Sanders has not been a backbencher. Bernie Sanders has been active in every role that he is, you know, he has taken. I mean, you have yeah. pictures going way back where Bernie Sanders was like two months old and fighting against apartheid like that's who Bernie Sanders is and and the same goes for Jeremy Corbyn we have history of him fighting for equal rights amazing and I really respect that of Jeremy Corbyn but I can tell you that Jeremy Corbyn wanted to give everyone wi-fi I can remember that he wanted to nationalize the railways I'm not a follower of Jeremy Corbyn but those are I know those were Jeremy Corbyn policies I can remember when Ed Miliband talked about freezing utility bills yes I can Mm -hmm. I have a clear sense even if I can't tell you line and verse of what Ed Miliband's manifesto was in. I had a clear, the vibes are important. <laughs> vibes only. Vibes are the most important thing. It's like, what is the sense you got from Labour, new Labour? Mm-hmm. That's what people voted for. Yes. What is the sense people got from Michael Howard and William Haig and that they didn't vote for the... What is the vibe that people got from David Cameron? And what's the vibe people get from... And Boris Johnson's all about vibes. I mean, he's, it's not substance. What is the, what's Keir Starmer's vibes? It's like you said earlier, it's grey. You neither have a progressive streak in you, and you neither have a liberal streak in you. In my opinion, Jeremy Corbyn, to me, had a progressive streak, but an he illiberal did. streak. Yes. Tony Blair had a liberal streak, but not necessarily a progressive streak. Mm-hmm. Keir Starmer... I don't detect the progressiveness and I don't detect the liberalness. What do you stand for? I think Keir Stammer went into the Labour Party as a, as a, the Labour Party leadership. I think he I think he didn't want I think he didn't want people to paint him. He didn't want to but what he did is he didn't paint himself. Exactly. And I think that's the problem. You need to go out and say this is who I am before anyone defines you. You come out and you say this is what defines me. And you define yourself and you speak to the people. And it's, it's exactly what you said. What is it that Keir Stammer stands for? Because even, even Labour at the moment, the most electrifying figure that I know in Labour is Andy Burnham. Andy Burnham is young-ish. He's handsome. He is, he, he fights. We saw how he fought for Manchester, Manchester Fund and the funding for the North when there was, you know, when the government essentially didn't, didn't want to give them money to deal with the, do with the number of cases that were, you know, rising, the incredible number of deaths up in the North. Even his article in The Guardian, I think it was last week or this week, essentially, I, I appreciate that, that energy yeah. of 
Yeah. If you people want me, I will come. Keir Summer would make a really good deputy leader of the Labour Party. You think so? Yeah, I think if you swapped it, you had Angela Rayner as leader. Vision, message, charisma, vibes. We're not, <laughs> not going to let go of this. And then you kind of no, had... It's important. No, it's important. Then you had Keir Summer maybe as deputy being more of a kind of like policy lead, doing the kind of policy coordination role. Or maybe even a shadow chancellor, but... Yeah, it, it's disappointing. And maybe just before we move to the next segment, what, what do you want from a Labour Party? If you were to... For you to, to put your flag in the sand and say, I am a card-carrying Labour Party member, I'm willing to go out there and knock doors for this party, I'm willing mm-hmm. to go out there and be an activist. Yeah. What would it take? What is it that you want from a party today? So that's a really good question. And it's, it's vibes, essentially, but vibes, it's substance. So when I, kind of going back to, we, we touched upon the culture wars and how Labour don't address them head on. We, you know how MAGA people, Make America Great people, they said, oh, we're taking back our country. And we hear the same thing here that, you know, we're making, yeah. you know, we're making Britain British, you know, be proud to be British. I want, to, I want a leader who says, guess what? No, I'm taking back our country. I love my country so much that I am in public service. And guess what? I watch, you know, you know, I, I have a flag. You know, I have a flag too. You have a flag, I have a flag. But guess what? My patriotism is, isn't of cloth. It's of a substance. Guess what I do on my weekends? Guess what I do for my community? What do you do for your community? For all these people who want to talk of patriotism and, and now, you know, I don't want, you know, European bureaucrats telling you what to do. You swap one master for another, but you still have a master. And, and I want a candidate to, I want a leader and I want a candidate to say, I'm, I'm, I love my country. I just don't, I love its people. I just don't love the systems that we have. And this is what I'm going to do about them. And, and, I, and I want that story to be told in a way that connects with different people. Whether you're a builder, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a doctor, whether you're a blue collar worker, white collar worker, how yeah. are my policies going to work for you? Yeah. Guess what? We, we both don't want starving children. But beyond that, what, what vision are you going to sell to someone? It's because even beyond the starving children, I want a policy that says, guess what? Not only are we going to feed every child in this country, we're going to make sure that we educate our children and, and tell me that story through technology and what technology is going to do for us. Because your message has to, has to come together with everything that's happening, has to come together with climate change, yeah. has to come together with the new civil rights movement that we have across the world, has to come in together with health, mental health. It's not enough to talk about, you know, I, I want to increase NHS funding. What does that mean to anyone? But you say to someone, guess what? I had a friend who, who's been through this. I have been through this. I've seen this. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to increase spending on for mental health services. Really tell a clear story as to what you're going to do for them. Climate change is happening, but guess what we're going to do? We're going to increase number mm-hmm. of units, STEM, for example, STEM funding by 500 million over 10 years, whatever the policy may be. Speak to, you know, you, in, in that way, you're speaking to students, you're speaking to young people, you're speaking to teachers, people involved in education. Sell us a really clear vision because, and that is a perfect antidote to Boris. Because Boris is all, all vibes, no substance. But let's be real. What is Boris's clear vision? What is, what is Boris's clear, what is Boris's clear flagship policy? You can say, this is all Boris and purely Boris. There's nothing. Not, there is nothing. Boris is just pure vibes. And, in this, and the fact that we can criticise Boris for... For no vibes, no substance, and Keir Stammer for no vibes, no for sorry, Boris for vibes, no substance, Keir for no vibes, no substance. As far as I'm concerned, what difference do they make? And the thing is, I have a clear sense of what parting with Boris feels like, what the vibes there are. I have no idea what what is what does a Starmer led country look like? What is Starmer's vision for the country in ten years' time? I have no idea. It's not clear to me at all. I don't think it's time to call for Starmer to leave, but I think the Labour Party needs the ruthlessness of the Tory party. Once they realise you're bad for them electorally, they let you go. The Labour Party needs to kind of rediscover that spine and say, look, you're not working for us. There's still two, three years to go till the election. It's time to rebuild. But I don't think Starmer, the Starmer experiment has worked. You know, he, he doesn't inspire. He doesn't motivate. He doesn't have a vision. He doesn't bring people along. He's a safe candidate. He's, he's like... He's, Clint, he's Hillary Clinton. 
The only argument for Keir Stummer is that he's not Boris Johnson. I don't think that's enough. Keir Stummer kind of reminds me of J. Cole. Wow. Wow. Look, I like J. Cole. Uh, wow. I, like, I like his music. I've been to his concert. There's something missing. It's just, it's just not popping. It's just not vibing. Like, there's a song here and there, but... The overall feeling when I listen to J. Cole's album, there's like a... Did you listen to the new one? I did. Is this what you're speaking to? There's a... I've said this to you before. There's like a seriousness to it that becomes heavy sometimes. That kind of languishes. Like, I don't need your, I don't need righteousness. His last album, that... Oh my goodness. That was heavy. I don't need to be preached to. Bring me along. Kendrick, for example... Now, Kendrick has vibes. All vibes and substance. Kendrick, I listen. J. Cole has substance, occasional vibes. <laughs> I tell you what, I'd rather listen to, give me 21 Savage. Give me, give me Gunner. Give me Little B. Give me, you know, give me. Uh, I was with you until you said Little B. It was with you. Is it Little B I'm thinking about? Young Thug, yes. Future, yes. Little B. What, the bass god? The bass god himself? The bass god himself, absolutely, yeah. Give me the Miko, maybe half the Miko, some of them. There's three of them. How are you gonna, How do you divide three of them into a half? <laughs> Jesus came down on his own and they're supposed to be a trinity. <laughs> this podcast just got theological. <laughs> Politics has to tap into psychological moment. There is a reason across the world people are voting for strong men. There's a reason across the world people are lurching towards the right. And a lot of that is a psychological response to the insecurity that's come with the rise of tech. Yes. The fragile nature of societies and the fragile nature of work. Coupled with unbridled capitalism and poor or, or inadequate regulatory frameworks to control, to control that. R- rising inequality. Mm-hmm. And people's response to these things isn't to then say, this is the regulatory overhaul we need. People have an emotional, psychological response to these things. Ironically, and you might say, well, you know, people are voting against their own interests. They're voting against their own material economic interests, but they're not voting against what they see as against their emotional, psychological interests. Mm-hmm. I've been thinking about this. If, I, if this was 1950, 1948... Very precise. July the 9th. The time machine keeps bumping up and... (laughs) And I was in India and you said to me, you can have independence on one hand, but this is going to come with significant hardship, economic hardship, social hardship, political hardship. Mm -hmm. Or you could remain as part of the British Empire and there's this kind of revised package that the British government have designed, right? So equal rights, participation in democracy, et cetera, et et cetera. I think most people would still go for the first independence. The politics of independence spoke to kind of this spiritual element. When you look at what's happening in Scotland, the reason people are voting for the SNP, yes, Nicola Sturgeon has demonstrated competency, etc. But the idea of Scottish independence speaks to a kind of psychological, spiritual, emotional need people have. Right? Even Brexit. Brexit spoke to... Yeah, that was the next one. That was the next one I was going to say. Yeah. Trump spoke to that as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. If Corbyn spoke to that, it might not be that enough people had that need, but mm-hmm. when, when Corbyn went to Glastonbury, oh, yes. there was something that people were responding to. It was a, vis- it was a visceral moment, and yeah. I think it's what you're saying. What is it that people need and how can we speak to them? As opposed to telling people what they need, let them tell you what they need. Because when you do that, you're giving people a sense of control. In this world where they feel there's a loss of control, the, I mean, we hear every night the planet is on fire, inflation is on the rise, crime in certain areas, I- equality, the, the shifting the, the shifting power balance where people who were disenfranchised are getting some power at the cost of people who are over-empowered and what that does to people. There's a reason why people had such a visceral reaction to Black Lives Matter to, and going back less than 70 years, the Civil Rights Act, there's a loss of power. And what do people do when they feel a loss of power? They go to the person who speaks in a way that they want to speak. There's a reason why we have Bolsonaro 
we have um i also get the filipino guy modi netanyahu in israel you look at the duterte, abs- duterte abs- the, the absolute de- retreat of left wing progressive progressive parties across europe i mean look what's happening in france we could legit see marie le pen having so much more power than she did the first time there's a, there's a re- there's a revitalization of those politics and what those politics speak to the irony is the only policies that have worked effectively in response to COVID left-wing politics. have been left-wing politics. Absolutely. State intervention, a furlough scheme. Big state interventions. None of this libertarian nonsense. Yeah. None, none of this individualistic crap. And yet the Labour Party is in retreat because we have a leader who cannot speak to the moment, who I'm, and you were saying this and I'm convinced, doesn't have a set of politics. No. It's fine if you don't, but can you at least let Angela Rayner whisper whisper some politics into you at night? Can you get her to record something <laughs> and you listen to it as an audiobook at night? I have one last thought about 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 what you were saying. Because I think there is a fear on people on the left where we're scared we're going to have to share our tent with people who are not for civil rights, people who are not for you know, for equal rights amongst, based on, you know, race, gender, sexual orientation, etc. Like, we're scared that we're going to have to share our space with these people as we seek big, big tent politics, right? And the fact is, it's okay to part, to, to have a timeshare with these people in our spaces. And that, and that goes to the first episode where we talked about rural politics. It, we can have a timeshare. Open the doors when, when we're talking about economic economic policies, you know, when we're talking about retraining people who work in oil-based industries, how we can retrain these people to to reskill and to retrain in new industries. When we're talking to people about, you know, we don't want government subsidies to, for example, animal agriculture, but we want to pump in subsidies to maybe plant agriculture. There's a way that we can speak to these people and speak to them with the empathy that we may not always receive back. Because the thing is, when you look at countries that are very stable, what you find is that People are happy, and people are happy because their needs are met. And, and we know that left-wing policies work. Policies yeah. of wealth sharing, tax, progressive taxation, progressive yeah. regulation, regulation where we seek to protect the environment, we seek to protect people's human rights. These work. And actually what we can do is the path is not a straight path from A to B. We'll have to take shortcuts. We'll have to take meandering routes. You know, before you speak to, and, I, and yes, this is going to be a stereotype, before you speak to Bob, the electrician from the North about gay rights, speak yeah. to his economic needs. And yes, it may, in your mind, it may be a sad state of affairs that we can't speak to people's humanity, common humanity with another, with another human being. But on your path to, to this utopia that you want to actualize, speak, meet people where they're at. Because yeah. Bob is going to be far more amenable to speak to you about you know, trans rights and gay rights and women's rights when he realizes, actually, I don't have to fight with these women. Yeah. Because guess what? I can, I, I, every day I wake up and I love my job. And I know that if something happens to me, the government government hospitals are very well funded. Mm. The, the, yeah, yeah. the doctors, yes, the doctors are brown, but that, doc, that brown doctor is really well educated, actually. And yes, yeah. he may not have thought so, but that's who Bob is, right? And we meet Bob where he's at and we say to Bob, what is it that you need? And, and the, yes, there, there may be a repulsion to share our spaces with these people. But the fact is we have to, because guess what? People on the right open the doors wide open. They don't care who. That's true. Look at Look at the Tory party. You have Jacob Rees-Mogg, who on one breath says he abhors abortion, but on the other hand, he's kind of okay with children starving. We have Nigel Farage. This is a party of quacks. It's a circus. And I, and I don't want to body shame and talk about, you know, the hairy woman and the eight-legged man but and let me speak to that metaphorically ideologically speaking that these are people who somehow how are they able to cobble together this mishmash of ideology but there's a common purpose how are they able to do it and why are we not able to do that and we need to be able to do that speak to people where they're at because people are far more amenable to the culture war stuff when you meet the immediate needs and that's something we need to really get on with and see, how do we speak to people in the North? How do, how do we speak to people in Scotland, in Wales? Because people are talking about the you know, Scottish independence. There, there's a Welsh independence coming on the hills. If we, because I've, for the first time in my life, heard 
something about Welsh independence. I didn't even know the Welsh wanted independence. I didn't even know what that was. Yeah. But that is coming. <sighs> we'll, we'll have to keep an eye on this and see um, how this develops. Before we close the salon, turn off the lights and send you away with your fresh fades. <laughs> it's time to kind of to burn some sage and clear the chakras. <laughs> well, all six of them. Are there six chakras? Hey, or count eight. as many as you want. <laughs> uh, multi, multi-coloured, multi-layered. And, you know, like lay your burdens down. And it's our ever popular something on my spirit segment. Have you got something on your spirit? Yes, I have something on my spirit. I text you today because I had reached the limits, the absolute limit. So at work, there are these, and a lot of workplaces have this, where you have shared resources, right? So it could be a meeting room that you have to book before you use. It could be a machine. It could be whatever. Yeah. So where I'm at, we have, we have, we have rooms, machines, etc. So I make a booking for this room. And I think I booked it for three o'clock. So me being raised well, I turned up at 2.45. And Standard. I, I got myself ready, got my tools, I'm ready to go. Suited, booted, ready to go. Yeah. So I'm like on my phone, on Reddit, you know. 2.45, 2.50, okay, 2.55. So at 2.55, when you see my head poking through the little window in the door, what, what, what do you think I'm there for? Because I see you see me. And you see me see you see me. So we see each other now. Spider-Man meme. Literally. Why do you then avoid my eye and continue what you're doing? So now it's three o'clock. I'm like, you know what? Give five minutes. No, I'm not in particular rush. But, you know, I, I book my time with adequate, you know, space for anything to happen. Three or five, okay. I'm getting a bit heated, but it's okay, you know. So I go and I say, hey, hey, friend. Hey, I've booked this room. Why are you acting like you don't know that? Because I booked this before you did. So you went ahead, you saw my booking from three to four, and you went in and booked from whenever to three. So you know you don't have this room. You know that. Mad. I booked the room first. I booked the room a week ahead. So you know it's my turn. So when you see me pop up, why are you sitting there shocked, chagrined, surprised? Wow. Bamboozled. <laughs> discombobulated. Flabbergasted. Flabbergasted. You're like walking in a dream. Why have this why am I, why do you think I'm here? So okay. Hey, I'm okay, so I'm like, okay, I booked this room. Oh, did you? Hmm, yes. No. Uh, I said, yes, I booked this room. Oh, okay. Um, I'll be quick. The levels of disrespect. I haven't even... The, okay, okay. Now, see, it was all going my way until I decided to do a self-sabotage and do the really British thing and say, no rush. See, but here's the thing. I was being polite. You didn't have to take that to really mean no rush. So now it's 3.15. So now I, I, I booked from four and I know someone else is booked because I take the time to look at the timetable. I'm like, okay, I can squeeze in my afternoon in 45 minutes. Okay. It is now 3.20. So now you're coming out being like, oh, thanks. But what are you thanking me for? Fam, at 3.10, I start pulling out sockets. <laughs> I'm pulling out plugs. I'm going to the mains. I'm flicking stuff out. Do you know what? I'm putting forks in sockets to cause a short circuit. For the whole building? For the whole building. I'm, I'm pressing alarms, fire alarms. I'm smoking in the toilet. I'm doing... So that was, okay, so that happened. No, no, so that happened. I said, I said okay, you know what? It's a Friday. I've got two, two, you know, it's fine. It's fine. Then this happened again this week. Same person. Different room, different person. So this is a, so this is a culture. This is, a, this is not just one person. This is just global at this point. It's a trend. It's a trend. It's a pattern. It's, it's statistically it's, significant. It's a lit motif. It, it's just happening. It's a motif. It's happening. So now I've booked the machine from 11 to 1. Once again, I've booked the machine before you. And you've made a booking before me and after me. So your booking flanks my booking. So you know that you came in at 9. You have to leave at 11. You know that. You know that because you made a booking. So I turn up to the room. The computer's occupied. Your stuff is all over the table. But you're nowhere to be seen. So now I have to go hunt you down. 
I'm texting, you know, when you're in the station and they say, if you see any suspicious <laughs> packages, text one, one, whatever. To the British Transport Police. I'm texting them. So I, so I pulled up the timetable and I said, I'm going to go with Mary. I said, oh, Mary, Mary's booked this. Okay, Mary. Okay. Where, what, what floor is Mary on? Okay, Mary. So, so I have to go and I'll find Mary. But I don't know what Mary looks like. So I have to go, so then I have to stop other people from doing their job and say, hey, hey friend, do you know where Mary, do you know who Mary is? So anyway, I find Mary and I say, hey Mary, I've booked the room from 11. It is now 11.10. Oh, you booked it? Oh, uh, the, where did the time go? In this fist, we're fighting. Mary, the arrow of time has not changed direction. It is ever forward. I'm fighting Mary. So, uh, so, oh, okay, I'll be with you in a minute. Mary, you've taken like 10 minutes of my time. I said, okay. So Mary goes in there, clears everything. Mary, I'll fight you. I'll fight you, Mary. I'll, Mary, I will find you. I now know where you are. I will, fight, I will find you, like Liam Neeson said, and I'll fight you. I'm coming for you. What? It's a pandemic. No, forget the actual pandemic. It's a pandemic of bad behavior. Just lack, et- low etiquette. None. Okay, so this is, this is giving me memory. So I don't have something in my spirit because, you know. You said it all. Amanda went and got therapy. I've been walking <laughs> in the countryside. You know, I've grown. I've <laughs> forgiven, not yet quite forgotten, but <laughs> people respecting time boundaries. I, I thought you saw it before. I called a meeting with someone senior to be like, I've got this proposal, I want to talk through it. Someone else is like, oh, I see you've got the meeting with said senior person. Can I hop on it? I'm just going to take 10 minutes because I think, you know, it's in the same space. Cool. They start talking 10 minutes. Hey, I'm a man of my word. I said 10 minutes out of an hour. I gave you 10 minutes at the beginning. So no, I'm not even giving you like the throwaway 10 minutes at the this. end. I remember this. Giving you 10 minutes at the beginning, you're like, our oh, project's kind of a line. And once you've got the audience of the senior person, we're good to get their thoughts. Cool. 15 minutes. I'm like, okay. Okay, you know, you have some questions. People asking you some questions. I convened a round table of the necessary people to get thoughts on my project. 50 minutes, 20 minutes. I'm like, like you, I'm like, if I speed through this bit of presentation, if I leave this bit out. Mm-hmm. Because it all still makes sense. My story still makes sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 25 minutes. Taking a piss. 30 minutes. Oh, you're taking a piss. If you have one of those thermal cameras... My core body temperature <laughs> needs to rise any higher and my cells will start denaturing. Lich, oh. I'm beginning to get like heat rash, seconds away from heat stroke. Who are these people? Who raises these people? 35 minutes. Oh no. 40 minutes. 45. Oh, I don't even know. At 45 minutes, you've got the cheek to say, oh, I know time's not on our side and... Uh, Time is not on... What? 45 okay. minutes, you're saying, oh, um, I know time's not on our side and no one wanted to say something. Say something. He had, a, he had a whole presentation. I didn't want to say something. I had a whole thing ready. I know what I wanted to say. Now you're giving me, now you're giving me 50 minutes of my own meeting back. Oh, thank you. How, how merciful are you? Right. You're yielding time back to me. I who created this time. I was Never so again. heated. Never again. I left that team within a month. Like, I'm not it's like, nah, nah, nah. Never nah. again. No, nah, but I've learned my lesson. Your inability to deliver a presentation in 10 minutes is none of my business. It's not my problem. 20 minutes, not on my business. Mm-mm. 25, that's now your business. That's everybody's business. It's a societal problem. <laughs> exactly. It's a pandemic of poor behavior. 45 minutes? I'm a piss. I've, I've learned my lesson. So from now on, if I have a booking, I'm just going to... Go five minutes. I'm going to make sure that you've seen me. I know that you've seen me. You know that I've know that you've seen me. We've seen each other. Great. And then and then I'm just going to be like, hey, I booked it at three. You have three minutes to get out. I'm telling you, I am finding the schematics of the building. I'm finding where the main sockets are. This has happened to me so many times. Like I make a booking, and people are upset at me that they've had to leave. In my case, when you when you get to the door, there's a little digital panel that tells you. The whole mm-hmm. schedule of the day because you book online. Yeah. So there's a whole, you can see. Your name is not on there. And sometimes you, you're standing outside. The people from your meeting are turned up and you're standing there. And when you when you open the door slightly ajar to look in, they all look around like. Yeah. 
Like you've interrupted something. Well, yes, I have, but that's not my problem. Girl. Next time I'm turning off the lights. <laughs> like, sorry, I didn't know. I'm, I'm turning off the light. <laughs> I'm finding the utility closet and I'm hoovering. It's not my job. I'm not paid to do it. I'm hoovering in the corridor. In the words of Pretty Patel, I'm making it a hostile environment. I'm doing all kinds of things. I am testing my ringtones. Honestly, I'm joining in. Or better yet, you just join in. Anything else? You know, this is just making me more upset when I think about it. Mm. And the thing is, I have a booking tomorrow. Do you know what? This has to be a running segment. You have to come back and report to us next time. What, what about I'm Mary? Oh, I will fight. And here's the thing. It's um, certain rooms and certain machines only certain people use. So I've checked. It's me and Mary. Introducing a new segment. What about Mary? Oh, I hate Mary so much. And the thing is, she doesn't, like, she doesn't even have the audacity to be nice about it. Hey, hey. Get your, sh- get your crap and move. Thank you for joining the Unpick podcast. I've been Kay and as always, ho- joined by my co-host S. Follow us on Unpick underscore podcast on Twitter and Instagram. Frequency of episodes. Until then, see you in two weeks time. Yeah, and just before we go, I just want to tell people that I talk Drake everything he knows. And he copied my whole flow, word for word, bar for bar. Spread the word. <laughs>